So uh, my name is uh, Michael Birnbaum, and I'm faculty here at MIT in the Coke. So our first speaker in this session is David Mooney from uh, Harvard in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and at the uh, Wies Institute. And he's going to be talking to us today about uh, biomaterials to regulate immune cell trafficking and activation. So thank you. So I want to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to participate. I've really enjoyed the meeting uh, this morning, and I'm looking forward to more over the next day and a half. So I'm going to be talking to you today about biomaterials, and not nanomaterials so much, but bulk materials that are intended to generate therapeutic responses against cancer antigens. And the uh, kind of prototypical device, the first generation device, is shown here. And I actually, I realized uh, after I had gotten the invitation, I went and looked back through my records. I had spoken here about, uh, I think, two or three years ago, largely on this device. So I'm actually not going to talk a lot about this particular device. Uh, I'm going to briefly give a little description of the premise that we've taken for how we want to use materials to generate potent immune responses. And then I'll tell you about kind of the next generation systems that we're currently working on and how we're actually seeing that they may be useful in a variety of different contexts in immunology. <coughs> So start with a little bit of background. That little device I just showed you is intended to generate a potent immune response uh, by the process that's shown schematically here, where we have a biomaterial uh, that's fabricated out of a synthetic uh, biodegradable polymer. Uh, it will release what I'm generically calling a recruiting factor. And for today, that will always be GMCSF. This will create a gradient in the surrounding tissue that will serve as a guide for the target cells, in this case, immature dendritic cells, to migrate and crawl right into that device. And then once they're in that device, the GMCSF can serve to proliferate those cells. Now, once the cells are inside the three-dimensional material, we then have an opportunity to control their microenvironment and to present to them signals uh, that may control their behavior. And in the context of today's talk, I'm mainly going to talk about delivering adjuvants. And I think all the data I'll present today will actually be with CPG oligonucleotides as the adjuvant and then various tumor antigens or other types of uh, signaling molecules. And once we have the dendritic cells appropriately loaded up with antigen and activated, the premise is they can then move to the draining lymph node, interact with T cells, and generate the kinds of immune responses that we're looking for. Now, uh, the general approach here, uh, we took a few years to work out. And the data that got us particularly excited about the possibility for this approach uh, was a study we published a few years ago where we used these uh, little pieces of plastic uh, in a therapeutic context with the B16F10 melanoma system that Daryl des uh, described this morning with some of his studies. Uh, so we introduced these cells into the mice. Uh, we wait nine days. And then we place one of these vaccines uh, into the mice. And if we look at the change in tumor size as a function of time or survival as a function of time, you see we have the typical exponential growth of the tumors. Uh, when we vaccinated a single time with the biomaterial, we moved the growth curve over to here. And we vaccinated at day 9 and day 19, we actually moved the growth curve down to here. And the reason why the growth was so stunted is we were actually seeing regression of about half of the established tumors in these animals. So complete regression in these animals did not ever demonstrate a recurrence of these tumors. So we had a, a quite a robust and, and uh, durable immune response raised against the antigens. So this made us quite enthusiastic about this general idea of using materials to control trafficking and activation of cells in the body and hopefully bypass the need to manipulate the cells ex vivo. Now, uh, since uh, I was here a couple years ago, we have done some of the obvious things with this system. So for example, a very important question today is how this concept uh, would interact with checkpoint uh, therapy. Uh, so we've done some very simple studies where here, for example, going back to the B16F10 melanoma model, um, our control animals uh, will die in a therapeutic model. If we vaccinate a single time, we about double the lifespan of these animals, but we don't get complete regression of the tumors with a single vaccination. So we did this so we could then look at what's the effect of adding a PD-1 or an anti-CTLA-4 antibody in combination with the vaccination. And what you can appreciate is we do get a really nice synergy between those two and now get regression of quite a large fraction of the established tumors when we combine a single vaccination with checkpoint blockade. For those of you who aren't so familiar with this model, I'm not showing you the controls of the antibody therapies alone, because they are actually ineffective as a monotherapy uh, in this particular model. So we're really looking at a, a synergistic effect of the combination of the two. 
Now, th uh, this and a lot of other data uh, led us a couple years ago uh, to propose a, uh, a first-in-man clinical trial. Uh, so Glenn Drainoff, who's been my collaborator in all this work, uh, and Steve Hody at the Dana-Farber were the um, PIs for an IND filing to the FDA. Uh, we had just formed the VIS Institute, and at the VIS we were able to do a lot of the preclinical studies that would be necessary to support the IND, and we collaborated with the Dana-Farber, so the VIS Dana-Farber vaccine, which WDVAX, was in, which is intended to be a therapeutic melanoma vaccine. And we had approval to um, start a clinical trial treating 25 patients with stage four melanoma. Now, I can't actually uh, talk a whole lot about the data from this because we actually have very little data at this point in time. What I can say is the uh, 13 patients that have been treated to date, uh, we are seeing that the therapy seems to be uh, safe. We are getting similar local reactions and responses to the vaccine as we did in the animal models. And the very limited data that we have suggests that we are getting some type of immune response as well that's generated from this vaccine. Uh, one of the pieces of data that leads us to believe this is shown here, where in one of the patients, uh, 10 months after vaccination, they did develop uh, a new tumor. Um, and we're able to then compare, um, actually, the original tumor that they had with this new tumor that formed after vaccination. And in this case, it's stained for T cells. And you can appreciate in the original tumor, uh, there is a collection of T cells that are mainly at the periphery and not penetrating into the tumor, as one typically sees. Uh, after vaccination, uh, we are getting a lot of T cells infiltrating into the mass of the tumor in some areas with uh, focal concentrations of the cells. And by both immunohistochemistry and fax analysis that Glenn Drainoff did, uh, these cells stain positive for a variety of um, surface markers that would suggest that they would be amenable to checkpoint blockade therapy as well. So we think that the data is promising, though it's very early on at this point to really know whether this will be effective or not. Now, in the meantime, um, we're not in the lab, uh, we're a materials lab, and so we're not kind of just sitting around waiting to see how this turns out. Uh, we're making the assumption that there will be some utility of this approach of using materials to control behavior of these immune cells. And so we're actively moving forward and thinking about how we can improve and change this system. So one of the things I didn't mention uh, to this point in time is, for example, the antigen. Currently, we personalize the vaccine by taking a biopsy from the patient. Uh, we create a freeze-dried powder of everything that's in that biopsy, so the matrix, the, the uh, cancerous cells, as well as all the non-cancerous cells. And then we place these within the three-dimensional structure where they get released to the dendritic cells that get recruited into that site. So we're beginning to explore alternatives to this uh, preclinically at this point in time. Um, so for example, uh, Alex Chung, one of the PhD students in the laboratory, has been exploring the idea of focusing more specifically on cancer antigens by first isolating the cancer cells out of the tumors and then making what he calls reduced cancer cells, which is to take intact cells and either extrude them or sonicate those cells to create small nanoparticles, a couple hundred nanometers in size. Uh, so these are membrane-enclosed vesicles that will hopefully contain a lot of the antigenic content of the cancer cells and not a lot of the content of the other things that we're not looking to vaccinate against. Um, so he's compared two different approaches, an extrusion and a sonication. They both retain a, a fairly significant amount of the total protein that normally would be in those cells. Uh, the sonication uh, approach to creating these reduced cancer cells leads to a much better repertoire of the intracellular and cell surface antigens uh, than the other approach. So we're actually moving forward with this approach. And just to give you a little flavor of kind of why we think this might be useful, uh, when we create these uh, vesicles, we can also load them with adjuvants such as CPG uh, or MPLA. Uh, and then we now have a single package that has the antigen and the adjuvant together. And we find in vitro that then when we pursue this, we get much better uptake of, in this case, a fluorescently labeled CPG when we have them in the reduced cells as versus free CPG. And this leads to enhanced activation of dendritic cells in vitro as indicated here by IL-12 expression from CPG within the reduced cells as compared to the same amount of CPG that's free, and similarly for MPLA as another adjuvant. And it's still pretty early on, but in some of the studies that Alex has done, he has demonstrated that these reduced cells do appear to make a better antigen source uh, for generating immune responses in vivo as well as compared to the lysate. So this is not with the whole vaccine system. This is a classic vaccination, just using the lysate or using these reduced cells in combination. Uh, and first of all, if you look at a T cell response, uh, when we after we vaccinate these animals and then isolate T cells from peripheral blood, 
uh, we, and then stimulate these um, ex vivo, we see that we do have many more interferon positive uh, CD8 cells resulting from using these reduced cells as the antigen source in contrast to a matched quantity of the lysate. And similarly, in terms of humoral responses, uh, we get improved uh, IgG1 and IgG2A titers. So we're beginning to move towards creating perhaps a, a better antigen source uh, for these vaccinations. Now, the other thing we're doing, and actually where we're focusing most of our efforts, though, is to get away from the current physical form of this vaccine. Right now, it's a small plastic disc about the size of a baby aspirin tablet, and it gets placed under the skin in an office visit. But it's an implantation, and then needs to be sutured in place. We'd greatly prefer to have an injectable version that we could put in a syringe and inject via needle. So we've been actually exploring this possibility using a variety of different kinds of materials. And the first that I'll describe to you is something called cryogels, where we take a polymer uh, and we will cross-link it uh, to form a gel. But before we allow the cross-linking to occur, we partially freeze it. So we create ice crystals within the solution as it's cross-linking. So the cross-linking will then occur around these ice crystals. And then later when we warm it up, the ice crystals will melt and we will have formed uh, hydrogel around the pores. It's very old technology in the material science field. Uh, this allows us to create highly porous three-dimensional materials, very similar to the current vaccine. So a lot of cells can crawl in. And here's just a cryogel um, that we're looking at under fax. And this is the work of a very talented PhD student, Sandeep, who's currently in the laboratory. So they're highly porous. And now in terms of injectability, why these are appealing is because these, unlike the stiff plastic materials we're currently using in the clinic, these ones are very elastic. So here's one of these devices being compressed with some forceps. And you can appreciate it springs back to its size and shape immediately upon release. Now, what this enables one to do then is to load these into a syringe and inject them via needle. And within about 200 milliseconds of coming out the end of a needle, they will go back to their original size and shape. So they have shape memory properties. So we can now inject these, uh, for example, here subcutaneously. They'll go through the needle, and they'll resume, in this case, uh, its rectangular shape after it's injected. So we're interested in exploring the use of these in a variety of different contexts. One of these is actually using them exactly as we use the PLG vaccine today. Uh, but since I've uh, already told you a little bit about that story, I'm actually not going to repeat that and show how we use it exactly the same way. Uh, instead, I'm going to describe uh, how having these materials opens up some other possibilities as well. So one of the things that we've been interested in is going back to something uh, that actually Glenn Drainoff had developed a number of years ago, uh, GVAX, that probably many of you are familiar with, where, again, a biopsy is taken from a patient's tumor, uh, but now living cells are isolated. Uh, they're genetically modified to secrete GMCSF, irradiated, and then returned back to the patient to generate an immune response. And so what C.D. Bencheroff uh, and Ting Shi in the laboratory now have been exploring is whether these cryogels could also make this type of cellular therapy more effective. And so the, the premise was perhaps we can bypass the need for genetic modification so to simplify this process and also perhaps make it a little bit more effective. So um, cells can be readily loaded onto these devices. Here we're looking at irradiated tumor cells that have been loaded onto the device. You can appreciate they adhere very readily. Uh, when we actually inject these via the needle, uh, about 90% of the cells stay associated with the material after injection and in vivo. And for those engineers in the lab who are, or in the audience who are wondering how cells can stay attached to something like that, we can talk about that later in terms of some of the mechanics of these systems. Uh, but uh, for today, I'll just say the cells stay attached. So now we can deliver these cells to a particular location. We'll have GMCSF being released from the walls of the device. And we can also load with CPG or other types of antigens. And just to give you one piece of data that this approach seems to be useful, Again, if we go back to the B16F10 melanoma model uh, in a therapeutic sense, um, here we're looking at some uh, data, again, tumor volume and mouse survival. And what you can appreciate is when we uh, introduce the, what we're calling the gel vax here for the gel containing uh, GVAX, uh, we get a regression of a substantial percentage of the tumors in this model. Now, I should note this model is not as rigorous as the one that I, from the data I previously showed you, we actually vaccinated a couple days earlier here than we did earlier, so the, vet, so the tumors did not get as large. But it does demonstrate that this approach may be useful not just for delivering various types of antigens, but we could perhaps make cellular therapies more effective as well. Now, these cryogels have a variety of features that also may make them very appealing for a number of other types of applications. And so I'd like to tell you about a couple of those. 
Now one is that we now have a, a depot in the body, we have a location where we can release some drugs, we can collect cells, and we may over time want to actually refill that device so it can keep releasing drug, because eventually it will run out, or we might want to change what agent we have locally there. We might want to sequence factors, or maybe if a patient doesn't respond to factor A, maybe we want to introduce immunomodulatory factor B instead. And so what Evgeny Brudno in the laboratory, uh, one of the postdoctoral fellows, has been exploring this concept. And the basic premise is that we would introduce one of these gels uh, someplace near a tumor site or other location in the body. It will release a drug uh, for some period of time or perhaps multiple drugs, but it will eventually become exhausted or perhaps we might want to change. At that point, either intravenously or orally, the patient would take a second drug. That drug would circulate through the body, but it would be chemically modified so it would have an opportunity to bind to the gel and in essence either load or reload that gel with a new agent or the same agent. Now, the drug will eventually be cleared from the circulation, but we'll now have captured hopefully a large fraction of the drug locally. And then we can have that drug released all over again, locally. And you could repeat this multiple times, either with the same drug or multiple drugs. Now, one of the uh, features of this that may be very attractive is this may allow us to prodrug certain agents so that we don't have to worry so much about systemic effects and they will only be active locally. So the basic idea is we would have our drug that would be inactive because we would have bound to it a cleavable linkage and the agent that will allow it to bind to the gel. We would then would have a complementary uh, chemical entity on the gel to which these two hopefully can bind in a unique manner compared to any other chemistry in the body. So the idea is you administer it in the blood, it circulates, it then can bind, and this whole time the drug has been inactive, uh, but then once it's bound, the bond can be broken and now you can release an active drug, uh, which may then protect from a number of side effects. Uh, we're currently pursuing this mainly from the perspective of click chemistry. We started actually with base pairing between DNA oligos, uh, but now we've gone to the clicks because it actually is, uh, we think, a much better system. And this is just one of the click chemistries we're using, but obviously there's a whole repertoire of click chemistries that one can use for this approach. And just to give you a little sense that this idea uh, may actually have some utility, I'll just show you a little bit of data. Uh, where, first of all, this is a demonstration that one can target a site multiple times. So here we have a gel that was injected, uh, and it's right around there. Uh, and now we're actually doing a series of, I believe, weekly injections, and I'm skipping a few, but we do nine injections serially. And each time we inject, we get about 7% of the drug that we injected to now localize to that location. Now here we're using a fluorophore, and we don't have a cleavable bond, so we keep getting more and more fluorophore. But when this is a cleavable molecule, you load the system, then obviously the signal would go away, and then you'd reload back and forth. And we have shown uh, as a really simple proof of principle that if we take uh, doxorubicin as a chemotherapeutic agent and take this approach where we have the ability to localize it and target it uh, to the tumor site, we can have a dramatic effect and keep these tumors from growing. Uh, this is a breast cancer model, I should mention. Uh, while well, if we just do the, the uh, normal dox injections, we get very poor control over time. Uh, but we actually get excellent control, and each time we reintroduce the drug, we get a drop in the tumor size immediately afterwards, or then a couple days after. So it looks like this general approach may be useful for loading and reloading different drugs at a particular site. Now, uh, one of the uh, current, uh, or one of the recent postdocs who came to the lab, Nassar Shah, and you can tell he's new because I don't have a, actually one of those cartoons of him yet, so I have to use a regular photo. Um, but he's a joint postdoc with David Scadden's lab over at MGH and Harvard. And he's working in this uh, general vaccination space, and he uh, came to me a few months ago and said, you know, this idea of vaccination is great, but he's interested in doing it in the context of AML. And he's like, but the problem is uh, oftentimes these patients, after they've had hematopoietic stem cell therapy, they have a dysfunctional immune system. After you do the uh, bone marrow reconstitution in these patients, it takes some long period of time, oftentimes one or two years, before they actually reconstitute T cells appropriately. So vaccination against residual disease isn't gonna be very helpful to these patients if they don't have the capability of responding. So what he suggested is, well, if we have these cryogel system, if we can recruit things like dendritic cells, why can't we recruit other types of cells to these systems to manipulate uh, and perhaps change this, uh, this scenario here? So what he proposed is that we could take a cryogel, we could load it appropriately, do the same type of thing, subcutaneous injection, but now it would recruit hematopoietic stem cells. 
So we'd create a new microenvironment, a new niche for these cells that we could recruit the cells. And then we'd also include signals uh, that would specify for uh, lymphocyte and T cells in particular to develop at that site. Now the approach he took was a very straightforward one. Instead of using GMCSF, he encapsulated BMP into the cryogel. The BMP will be released at that local site. It'll bring in osteoprogenitors. Uh, you'll create a bony nodule uh, ectopically. Here you can see uh, what one of these gels looks like that's forming a bone. Here's the micro CT image. And here's some histology. The bone basically is stained blue here. The residual cryogel is this red. And you can appreciate there's actually a lot of marrow space in there as well. Now to specify T cell uh, formation, he then covalently conjugated a notch ligand that David Skadden's lab had identified as being very important in this process, uh, DLL4. So the idea is the hematopoietic stem cells will come in there, they'll start to multiply, and then with appropriate signaling, perhaps we can enhance T cell reconstitution. Now I'm not going to go through a lot of data, but I will show you one uh, snapshot indicating that this does seem to have some promise. Uh, so this is a, a bone marrow reconstitution, an animal model, uh, where we do uh, basically a lethal radiation. Uh, we come back with uh, cells from a donor that we can genetically distinguish from the host cells and either do a whole bone marrow transplant or do a T and B cell depleted bone marrow transplant. And we look then at the reconstitution of T cells, B cells, and myeloid cells. Now, as you'd expect, when you do either type of transplantation, the myeloid cells bounce back really quickly, which is well known. Uh, in the control, uh, you have a real delay in reconstitution of the T cells, particularly when you've done uh, the T cell depletion from the bone marrow. In contrast, if we have the cryogel create this bony nodule, and particularly if we include the DLL4, you can appreciate we got a substantial increase in reconstitution of the T cells. And now within about 20 weeks, we're getting pretty close to the control uh, normal level of T cells. So about a two to three order of magnitude increase in T cells, so restoring immunity to these animals. And now if actually you go back and try to vaccinate these animals, you can be effective at vaccinating these animals out here when you're ineffective in the controls. Now, uh, one, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, uh, but one of the key issues, of course, is with this approach, it certainly would be possible that we would actually not be reconstituting a broad repertoire of T cells, but that we would just be promoting actually clonal expansion of a few T cells that happen to be left. Um, and so he's looked actually at the heterogeneity of the T cell response that's generated. And you can appreciate when we have the cryogels, we get a much more heterogeneous response in terms of T cells uh, than we do in the control system. So it looks like we are reconstituting a pretty broad T cell repertoire, as well as accelerating this process quite dramatically. Now, the last thing that I'm going to describe is I think I've got a few minutes left. OK. Um, so the last topic that I'll describe is, again, going back to this idea of injectable system. So we'd like to have something we can inject. And the cryogels are injectable. Uh, but in parallel with the development of that system, um, Eileen and Jay in the laboratory, and Jay now is actually off running his own lab, um, proposed a very different idea. And they said, instead of actually trying to fabricate something outside the body and then have the challenge of getting it into the body, why don't we instead just inject particles that have the ability to form a three-dimensional structure once they're in the body? So where we're going with this over the long run is obviously self-assembly, but over the short run, the approach they took was much simpler. And that was to take a mesoporous silica microparticles that have a very high aspect ratio. So you can think of them as being like matchsticks, but on the micron size scale. Now, these have uh, aligned nanopores. So they have a space that we can load a biological cargo in these nanopores. And these can be readily injected in a saline solution subcutaneously or other places in the body. So the idea is you just inject these after they've been loaded appropriately with the biologic agents. And then the saline will dissipate into the surrounding tissue. And the particles will then simply collapse on each other. And if they are high aspect ratio, they will pack very inefficiently, leaving a very porous material. So a really simple concept here. So how they've then actually pursued this is they've then gone ahead and synthesized mesoporous uh, silica uh, with relatively high aspect ratio. These are about 80 to 120 microns uh, in length. Uh, you can appreciate from this TEM image that they do have the aligned nanopores, about seven uh, nanometers in size, where we can load the cargo. And when one takes a collection of these and injects them in a saline solution, you do indeed get formation of a pocket subcutaneously 
where when you look at it under histology, you can appreciate that that space has been infiltrated by a large number of immune and inflammatory cells. So you are able to bring a lot of cells in, and I should mention this is all, again, releasing GMCSF from the system to drive the process. Now, the, the geometry does matter here. As I mentioned earlier, their premise was by having high aspect ratio particles, they would pack inefficiently, so you could get a lot of cells to come in. And that's what they see when they use uh, long particles. If they use the same mass of, of particles, but now they're short, and they actually then pack much better, they don't leave very much space, and now you don't bring in many cells. If you take a look at this uh, kind of histology, um, where here the mesoporous has been stained uh, with a basically green fluorescent dye before introduction, you can appreciate that the cells you're seeing here are all coming in and infiltrating all around and throughout these uh, polymer, or excuse me, these mesoporous uh, silica microparticles. So they're having an intimate contact uh, with the system. Now, in the paper that I cited in the, in the last uh, uh, couple um, slides, they actually worked out very nicely how the system can be potentially used as a therapeutic cancer vaccine and demonstrate some very nice data in that paper, uh, very similar to how the PLG vaccine is being used. We release GMCSF, we introduce, um, we bring in the cells, we give them CPG, uh, we give them antigen, uh, they make it back to the lymph nodes. What I'm gonna talk for the next few minutes about is something a little bit different, which is everything I've described until now has been based on uh, the idea of generating a CTL response. And I haven't actually talked about antibody responses at all. So I'm gonna talk now for the next few minutes about the work they've been doing to look at humoral responses with the system. And first, what I'm gonna do is kind of actually skip some data. I hope it's okay. Uh, but just kind of summarize what they were able to show previously with the system is when they released the GMCSF, they could get immature dendritic cells. And also they found a relatively high fraction of B cells coming into the site. Um, these cells would get activated, they would be deployed and they were able to show that you'd get expansion in an antigen-specific manner of T follicular helper cells, and you'd get germinal center formation. So it looks like this system may have some utility in terms of generating antibody responses. And the particular data that they, we had shown previously was using alvalbumin as the model antigen, loaded onto the system, and they showed that they could actually uh, generate quite high titers. In this case, looking at an IgG1 antibody, an IgG2A antibody response, again using ovalbumin. And you can appreciate if they use a soluble vaccination or soluble protein, uh, they get a pretty poor response. But if they use the, the MPS without the CPG, meaning just has ova but no CPG, or the complete vaccine, you get very high titers of the IgG1, and you only get the high titers of IgG2A if you have the adjuvant, the CPG there. So it looks like the system is generally, or it might be useful. They've actually gone on in some data I'm not gonna have time to show you today, showing that they can achieve similar results with uh, long peptides. But we've actually now been extending this to the idea of trying to understand if we could actually use this even for very small peptides. So in particular, uh, they've been looking at GNRH as a model antigen here. So it's a sex hormone in our body that controls reproduction. And they've been looking to see whether they can generate potent responses against this kind of target. Because if they can, it would suggest that the system has some very broad utility. Now, they've been exploring a variety of different ways of presenting this antigen. And I'm only going to show you a couple of them here, but there's a number of others. Uh, for example, you can directly conjugate these uh, to, directly to the mesopore silica. It has a lot of surface chemistry that's very convenient. But here what they've done is compared uh, simply doing absorption of the peptide uh, onto the particles along with CPG to make the vaccine making a conjugate of the uh, peptide with CPG, with the premise being based on a lot of work previously done in the field, that having co-localization of these two as they go into a cell would give a favorable response. And then they've also looked at making a conjugate of the GNRH with a carrier protein. Here, OVA, but also uh, KLH, uh, more or less gives the same results in our hands. Um, and then making the vaccine, and then going ahead and injecting these mice. And so what they found is that if the antigen is presented appropriately, if this peptide antigen is presented appropriately, they can generate very high titer responses. So here we're looking again at IgG1 titers and IgG2A titers. Um, now, interestingly, when they deliver uh, the GNRH um, unconjugated or conjugated to CPG, there is a little bit of response. It's kind of buried in the noise now, but the titers are actually very low. However, when they make, uh, when they use the conjugate with the carrier protein, they get very high titers that are actually very durable. You can appreciate now these numbers are out about a year or so. So we're able to get the IgG2A in particular, which obviously is more relevant for 
or is very relevant for tumor immunotherapy, get very high titers with a single injection. And I should actually stress this. The whole purpose of this is we want a system where we can do a single vaccination. So we're not talking about doing weekly boosts or biweekly boosts. This is a single injection. We're able to get these kind of titers that last for out over a year. So now we're obviously kind of interested in understanding how this is working and you know, what might be going on here. Well, one thing we know that uh, the system itself degrades in about a month. So this is amorphous, amorphous silica. It's not the crystalline silica some of you may be more familiar with. So it's amorphous and it will dissolve. Uh, if you look at the volume of the nodule that forms, um, you see that originally form a little nodule in the animal. By about 20 to 30 days, it's completely gone. And if you look by histology, uh, you can't see any of the mesoporous silica anymore by day 30. So whatever's happening has to be happening in the first 30 days. And then after that, the system seems to be gone as far as we can tell. So Maxence, uh, a new PhD student in the laboratory, just finished what I think is a really nice experiment where to put a lower limit on how long uh, the activity was here, he did vaccinations, but then he would explant them at various times. So here's just the control of the vaccination that went in and stayed in. Um, and here's a vaccine that was only in for one day or three days, or then these green is five days. And you can appreciate that if the vaccine is in place for less than three days, we get no effect. Only if it's there for about five days do we have an effect. That's actually the time point at which in this system we know we have dendritic cells that came to the device, picked up antigen, and are now in appreciable numbers back in the lymph nodes. Now, if he waits seven or 15 days and explants, you get almost the full effect. So it looks like uh, this device needs to be in place for somewhere between seven days or somewhere around seven days to really have significant effectiveness. And we think this is a multiplication effect and that during this time, we're continuously getting cells coming to the device, picking up antigen, getting activated, and moving on to the draining lymph nodes. Now, uh, a feature of why this may be uh, fairly uh, potent in terms of the response comes from looking at actually the germinal center formation uh, in these animals. So here we're looking at, again, a vaccination study. Now it's a vaccine that was placed and stayed in place, taking all the same active ingredients but just doing a bolus injection, so without the mesoporous silica, or naive animals. And looking, first of all, at the cellularity of the draining lymph node and then the germinal center B cells. And what you can appreciate is the cellularity in the lymph node and uh, the percentage or the number of B220 GL7 cells both increase very similarly when we introduce the vaccine or just do a bolus injection. So both, in both cases, we get a lot of activity at the lymph node, as you'd expect. However, with the bolus injection, you very rapidly lose that effect, while when we have the mesoporous silica, we actually have a maintenance of germinal center activity that goes out for at least several weeks. Uh, by day 50, it appears to be largely dissipated. So one would expect that uh, we're going to have a, a bigger effect, perhaps, with this. And this now gives a much longer time for the recombination events to be occurring to hopefully be generating actually much more uh, uh, high affinity antibodies as a result of this vaccination approach. So I'm going to finish up here. And hopefully what I've been able to give you a little flavor for is how we're trying to develop what we call biomaterial-based immunotherapeutics. And the whole premise here is we want to control the timing and the spatial interactions of immune cells with various types of modulatory agents. And the theme to everything that we do here is versus a lot of the nanoparticle work that others are doing so beautifully is that nanoparticles are usually introduced and then the hope is that they traffic to where the cells are. We instead bring the cells to the material and once they're there, we introduce whatever information we want uh, them to have. Um, we think this may be a broadly useful platform for cancer vaccination. Uh, we're be, we've been seeing robust cellular and humoral responses. Uh, it appears this system may be amenable to a wide range of different types of antigen sources. Um, and we think it might have some pretty broad um, utility. Uh, where are we going right now with this? Well, one direction is obviously uh, we're looking at a wide variety of different cancer models to see how broadly applicable this is. We have looked, though I didn't have time to describe today, with these systems and a number of different uh, mouse models to date, uh, including breast models, uh, lung models, glioblastoma, in addition to the melanoma that I described today. We're thinking that these approaches, uh, since they seem to be very effective at generating both humoral and cellular responses, may be broadly useful and useful for things like infectious diseases. And then actually that little bit of work I showed at the GNRH, uh, we actually have funding to, do, to look at that in the context of a single shot reproductive vaccine for dogs and cats which I have dogs, so it's at least of interest to me. Um, 
I want to finish up by saying all the work I described today was funded by the NIBIB, and then a little bit at the end by Found Animals. Uh, all the work was done in very close collaboration with Glenn, who I still have listed at Dana-Farber, though he obviously has moved on now. Uh, Omar and Ed at the VIS have been critical to all the work I've just been describing. Uh, Steve Hody and Jerry Ritz um, are essential, and Steve is running the clinical trial, and we're doing the manufacturing of the vaccine in Jerry's facility. And then more recently, uh, David Scadden and Kai are providing a lot of um, a wonderful collaboration to us. So thank you.